Uh, okay, I'm recording now. All right, so just to start again, um, for the purpose of the recording, uh, tonight we're going to uh, touch base on chapter nine, and then in addition to chapter nine, we will get to uh, chapter 10.1. So can you just let me know that you're hearing me fine? I'm using a different microphone this evening. So I like to kind of get a sense of whether or not I'm being heard. Am I being heard? Yeah. yeah I can hear you. Thank you very yeah. much. Perfect. Okay. So chapter nine, hypothesis testing. I'm not sure uh, if you had a chance to engage the, the pre-recorded video, but let me just give you a quick synopsis of chapter nine, which has to do with hypothesis testing. Now in chapter eight, we focus on the topic of interval estimation, whereby interval estimation, what we're talking about is trying to estimate a population value with a confidence interval. So say we wanted to estimate what's the average that a student will get on a statistics test, um, a statistics final test. Uh, we may have sample data, and we use the sample data to generate a confidence interval, a 95% confidence interval, 99% confidence interval, and so on for the true mean score or mark on a statistics final uh, examination. And I could tell you, historically, the marks could vary anywhere between 65 and 75, which is actually not bad for statistics, since a lot of people find statistics difficult. So historically, we have not done too badly when it comes to stats, all right? And it all depends if you apply yourself, you will get a good grader, trust me on that. So the uh, hypothesis testing really is about now not finding uh, a, an interval for the um, population parameter, but rather making a claim about the parameter and then trying to see if sample data can support that claim or reject the claim. So for example, let's say um, we believe in a particular industry, let's say teachers. It's believed that the average salary of teachers is actually increasing. So if we believe the average salary of teachers is increasing, that's a claim, all right? If we say that um, smoking among young people uh, is actually reducing, maybe because of some sort of campaign to try to get young people to smoke less. Um, that's a claim. And sometimes we want to test those claims. So another word for claim is really a hypothesis. So we hypothesize that uh, young people are smoking less. We hypothesize that salaries are improving. We might say, um, do we have a sort of growing uh, a sort of a growing um, disappointment with government, as, a, as, a, as an example. And so in a case like that, we can make a claim that there's sort of an increasing level of distrust of government. And that's a claim. But we have to try to verify those claims by looking at sample data. Somebody could ask you, well, on what basis are you making this claim? So that's really a hypothesis. So we just got. Uh, we just sort of discuss with you the whole process of how you set up a, a a claim and a competing claim. So if we say that there is growing distrust of government, then the counterclaim to that is that there is not growing distrust of government. So hence we call those what uh, a null hypothesis and an alternate hypothesis, or a research hypothesis and a null hypothesis, and so. I just, if you just spare, uh, bear with me for one minute, I notice my, um, I don't have my computer plugged in and my battery is 5%. And let me get my plug to plug it in so we, <laughs> we don't lose the lecture, okay? So hang tight, give me a, a quick minute. Let me get my uh, power. power bar.
excuse me. <clears throat> Happy Pancake Tuesday, by the way. I hope uh, you guys had some pancakes tonight, or you're going to have some. There's pancakes cooking in the kitchen, and I'm missing out. <laughs> uh, well, hopefully, they'll save me one. Okay, I think we have juice now. There we go. All right. So as I was mentioning, in terms of um, hypotheses, uh, hypothesis testing is really about stating these competing hypotheses, right? A classic example of a hypothesis test is a court case. We have a defendant, and we make a claim about a defendant. We say that person is guilty or not guilty. So <clears throat> you know about the approach that we take in our legal system, that somebody is innocent until proven guilty. So that means the assumption about the individual is innocent, and then it is the prosecution that has to now find evidence to contradict that. So in a hypothesis test, typically what you have is that you will call the assumption that you're making that, you, you know, you will assume something is true. So if I say that um, salaries, I believe salaries are increasing, then maybe that's, that's what I want to investigate. So what I'll assume is true is that salaries are not increasing. And so if uh, I assume that that is true, I must find evidence to counter that. So I cannot prove that salaries are not increasing as such, but what I could do is to find evidence that contradicts that. So if I notice, if, for example, on average, uh, the average salary uh, for teachers is about, uh, say, $40,000, right, uh, per year. That's supposed, historically what it's supposed to be. But somehow we found a random sample of 100 teachers with an average salary of $45,000. That seemed to suggest that salaries are better, better than $40,000. So that would counter our assumption that salaries are not increasing, all right? So the idea is that we must have these opposing hypotheses, one which we call the null, and the null is just what we use as our assumption, our initial assumption, and we will pretend that that is true. And then the alternate hypothesis is really what we're trying to prove. So in a court case, we really want to prove the defendant guilty. In the case of the teachers, we want to prove that salaries are improving. So all we just do is set up the counterclaim, which is the null hypothesis, and look for evidence that is contrary or contradicts that uh, particular claim. So that's what we call the null and the alternate hypotheses. And uh, so typically we would denote that by HO, H1, HO would be... So that would be your null, and then HA would be your alternate hypothesis, all right? So remember, the null is what we assume is true. Alternate is what we want to prove. But, but when we say prove, not mathematically, but statistically prove, okay? So that's our, our hypothesis, no, our hypothesis. Now, because we're using statistics and not, say, mathematical formulae that have concrete proof, but rather we're taking a sample and from that sample, we will, you know, we will examine how strong that sample contradicts the null hypothesis. There is a possibility that we can commit errors. Those errors are called type one and type two errors. So, and I will show you uh, the definition. I'm just sort of going through these uh, two areas, these two sections right here as introduction before I actually show you some notes. And as I mentioned, I'm just going to do a quick review of this chapter because I, I did uh, in the video some examples on that. So why is it that we uh, can conclude errors? Let's just take the court case, for example. So we assume that the defendant is innocent until proven guilty. The prosecution wants to find them guilty. 
So what does the prosecution do? Try to gather evidence. And sometimes the evidence that is gathered may not be clean evidence. It may be tainted. It may be circumstantial. So it is possible that we could find a defendant guilty. That is, we reject the non-hypothesis, but in fact, they're not guilty. They're not guilty. So in a case like that, you've committed an error when you find an innocent person guilty, and that, that happens. Uh, there was a classic case in Nova Scotia, the Donald Marshall inquiry, where a native man was, uh, was um, accused of committing a crime, murdering uh, an African Nova Scotian. And he spent 11 years in jail for a crime he did not commit. Found out that the actual perpetrator was a gentleman by the name of um, Sandy Seal. And he was the one who committed the murder. But the police wanted to find this man guilty. So they, and there was a whole investigation into that situation where they cooked up the evidence and everything and presented false evidence. So they claimed that he was guilty when he was not. So that was an error. But there are also cases where you may not have strong enough evidence. The prosecution cannot find enough evidence, but that person is actually guilty. Somebody commits a crime, somebody steals, but they couldn't find a witness or they couldn't find fingerprints or anything like that. In which case, it doesn't mean that that person is innocent. It's just that you couldn't prove them guilty. So we will not reject the null hypothesis in that case. And so, even though the person might be guilty, we have to say we don't have enough evidence to find them guilty. And that is also an error. And we call that type two error. So type one error is rejecting the null hypothesis, which is true, that is rejecting a true null hypothesis. And type two error is failing to reject a false null hypothesis. So in this case where the person is actually guilty, that's that means that the null hypothesis is false, but we could not find them guilty. We did not have enough evidence. We failed to reject a false null hypothesis. And as a result, we call that a type two error. So those are the two types of errors. And what happens is whenever we're conducting a hypothesis test, we have to try to control those errors because the different errors, the different errors have consequences. So for example, putting an innocent man in jail has a consequence, destroy this person's life. So you want to minimize putting innocent people away. At the same time, letting guilty people go free is also dangerous. If, if you have a serial killer who you cannot um, somehow convict, because, convict them because you don't have enough evidence, that person may go and commit a crime again. So it has consequences. So in a hypothesis test, we are trying to balance those two types of errors that can be committed. And in the case of a, a, a court case, uh, we tend to use a jury. And the jury of 12 uh, people, not sure why 12, but, um, and so if all 12 people say guilty, the idea is that there should be a small risk that those people are wrong. But again, we, we've shown, as we've seen in many cases in, in the legal system, where people were wrongly accused, even by a jury. So it is, it is certainly possible. So in hypothesis testing, those things are possible because it's based on sample evidence. Our proof, quote unquote, is based on sample evidence. So let's just go through a couple of those um, slides here and I will explain some of the concepts to you. So I've already mentioned what hypothesis testing is all about. It's about making a claim and then um, trying to find evidence to support the claim. So we have a research hypothesis or an alternate hypothesis, that's the other name for it, and the null, which is what we will assume is true. So we basically are setting up an experiment where we'll say, let's assume that the um, defendant is innocent. Now let's try to prove them guilty. So that's kind of how, what we do here. And we denote the null hypothesis by HO and then HA, or in this case, sorry, I, I said H1. Some books use H1, but um, this book is using H HA for altern A for alternate hypothesis. All right. Um, I'm going to skip some of these things. So just some examples of research hypotheses or alternate hypotheses. Uh, you see here a new teaching method is developed that is believed to be better than the current method. So in this case, 
our, 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 our research hypothesis or our alternate hypothesis is that the new method is better. So HA would be new method better. So what is HO? Which is the opposite of that, the new method is not better. So new method not better. And so um, that's just an example right here. The, if we keep on going, uh, there should be some other ones. A new sales force bonus plan is developed to attempt to increase sales. So you say, let's test this. Do we see sales increasing? In other words, we want to maybe see if this new system is working. So we'll say our research hypothesis is that the new bonus system is improving sales versus it is not improving sales. So one is the exact opposite of the other, all right? And we could sort of um, put that in, in terms of symbols in this fashion. So this is the case where we are hypothesizing about a population need. And so we have three ways of, of stating those hypotheses. It all depends on the problem. So HO has one example here. And we refer to the test that we're going to conduct as a one-tail or two-tail test. I'll make that a little clearer for you uh, shortly. But our research hypothesis is that the mean is less than a particular value. So that means the alternate hypothesis would be that the mean is greater than or equal to that value. One of the things to notice is that the null hypothesis always has the equal sign, always. All right, why? Because when we're testing the hypotheses, we have to say, okay, let's assume the mean is equal to a particular value. And since our assumption is in the null, that's where the equal sign must be. So we'll say, let's assume that the, no, that the uh, mean is mu zero. Let us find evidence that it is less than mu zero. So an example could be, <coughs> excuse me. What if I am want to test that, that um, the cost of heating oil is decreasing, right? Average cost of heating oil. So I'll say it's decreasing. That's what I want to prove. Let's say the average um, monthly expenditure on heating oil for, for a family of four. So we could say maybe historically it was $500, right? And, that, and we're focusing on winter. So $500. So if it's decreasing, the mean should be less than $500 now. If it is not increasing, decreasing, sorry, then it should be the same or more. So that's where the equal sign is. So what we will do in, our, in conducting our test, we'll say, well, let's assume it's equal to $500, the average. Let's take a sample. Let's look at the evidence. Is the evidence suggesting that it is less than $500? So um, what we would do is we take a random sample, maybe of 100 households, find the average monthly expenditure. What if you found that the average monthly expenditure was $475? See, ah, that's evidence. That's evidence that is decreasing. The only question, though, is, is it enough evidence? And that's when we start getting to our test statistic and our decision rules and all of those sorts of things. Because, but if I saw a random sample that gave me, uh, say, a... Uh, a sample mean of say $525. Well, that is not helping me out with my claim that average cost of heating oil per month in the winter is reducing. It's not, that's not helping my claim, all right? So we start off with the hypotheses, then we have to go a step further and gather evidence, evidence from a sampling process, all right? I'm going to... Um, Skip on. We talked about errors. <clears throat> now, I'll come back to this whole concept of p-value approach and critical value approach, because I, I believe that those things can actually confuse people a little bit. So I'll spend a little bit of time on that, but let me just um, very quickly get to the idea here. 
of the test statistic. I'm looking for the five steps. I'm coming back to, to these things, p-value and, cl and classical approach and so forth. All right. So we're going to, I'm going to spend a little time going through these five steps that your book outlines on hypothesis testing. And then I'll, I'll, I'll get into a little more explanation of the different parts, right? So we've already talked about hypotheses essentially as what we need to state from the beginning. And this is an example where we want to find evidence that the mean is greater than 12, whatever that represents, versus we will assume that the mean is not greater than 12, in which case it'd be 12 or less. Now we specify a significance, a significance level. What does that mean? And a test statistic, what is all of that about? So let me try to get these two parts to you because those three steps are the, uh, uh, um, and then there's a fourth part, which is called a decision rule. Those are the important parts of setting up the problem. So what is the level of significance? The level of significance is really a probability for, for us that sets a limit on the chance that we want to be wrong with type one error. Now, when I say, remember what type one error is. Type one error is rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. Rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. So what happens is that we look at a sample, we look at the strength of that sample, and we say, should we reject the null hypothesis on the basis of that sample data? If we say yes, then there is either a chance that we are correct, or there's a chance that we could be wrong because remember that there are errors with the test. So if we reject the null hypothesis, we can commit type one error. Type one error is rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. That is convicting an innocent person. But what we want to do is to limit our chance of that kind of error to alpha. And that's what we call a significance level of the test. It is basically a measurement of the maximum chance that we're taking when we reject the null hypothesis, the chance of being wrong, that is, the maximum chance. Now, to appreciate that, I have to show it to you in the form of a diagram, all right, and I, which, which I will do. Let me just mention uh, briefly again the, um, sorry, number three. Let me just mention what that's about, and then I will try to give you my own little diagram explanation of those two concepts, and hopefully you'll get it. Because I know it's, it's not an easy concept to grasp, um, you know, just straight up. So the test statistic now is really a, a tool, a scale for us that measures how strong the evidence is, how strong the evidence is. So it's like, it's like you know, weighing, um, if you, you know, Anything, you, you put it on a scale and then you find out what the weight is. So you want to know if your, your luggage is heavy, what do we do? We say, well, 50 pounds is what the airlines allow you. And when you go beyond 50 pounds, it's considered heavy, all right? So in that case, um, the scale weighs your bag. Well, it's the same idea. We need a scale to weigh the evidence. And that scale that we use is a Z value or T value. It's a Z value if the sampling distribution is a normal distribution, or it's a T value if the sampling distribution is a T distribution. We use that to weigh the evidence. And if the evidence is heavy enough, quote unquote, or strong enough, then we will reject the null hypothesis. In other words, we will say that our claim is supported. Now, I want to refresh your memory on the concept of outliers, which we did back in chapter two or three. I think it was chapter three, when we said that um, if we took the distance between the population mean and a value in the distribution, and we measured that in standard deviations, we got Z scores. Those Z scores give us a distance, how many standard deviations a value is away from the mean. And when the Z scores are like three and above, we consider them outliers, why? because they are rare occurrences. They are outliers, they're not normal, they're not, they're not frequent. 
And I need you to go back to that concept to understand how this plays into hypothesis testing. So I'm going to actually give you a more of a pictorial demonstration or a schematic demonstration of this concept of, of this whole concept, all right? So bear with me here for a second. So let's just take the example of the heating oil. So if we believe average heating oil is 500 or more, that's HO, remember? Mu is greater than or equal to 500. But we, be, we want to test that the mean price for, or the mean cost of heating oil for a family of four during the winter months is less than 500. In other words, it's decreasing for whatever reason. Maybe people are being more energy con uh, conscious. Maybe the price has gone down. Um, but there is this idea. So if we assume that the true mean is 500, so that's a uh, HO, we assume that, and we're looking for a random sample, we take a random sample of N. Let's, um, you know, it could be any number. Let's just say for now, we'll take 100 households. If we get a sample mean of say $475 for that sample, where does that fall? Well, that sample falls to the left, $475. It falls to the left. And because it is smaller than the 500, it seems to be supporting our research hypothesis. It seems to be supporting it. The question is just how much, um, you know, just, just how strong is this support? So how can I weigh this? Well, this support would be very strong if we have evidence that this is almost an outlier. This 475 is an uncommon value. Outliers are uncommon. That's why we call them an outlier. They're uncommon. And so if we could kind of measure whether or not 475 is an uncommon value or an outlier, that will help us with that answer, with that answering that question. Well, how can we do that? By getting a Z score. But how do we find Z? Z is X bar minus mu sigma over root N, or S over root N, depending on the sample size. So if we could take that value and convert it, so here's our mean, here's the X bar that we just got, and if we had a, um, a standard deviation uh, sigma of, say, $100, then we could kind of figure out that value of Z, okay? And so I'm sure you will agree with me that the kind of sample values that will support HA are those sample values that are smaller than the 500. So if we keep going towards the left, we're getting stronger and stronger, right? In terms of our sample evidence. If I got 450, that's definitely smaller than 500. If I got 425, that's definitely smaller than 500. If I got 375, that's definitely smaller than 500. If I got $200, that's definitely smaller than the 500. So the more I go to the left, the stronger my evidence is, right? But at some point, I will say, you know something? This is sufficiently an outlier. In other words, this value that I got is not reflective of the 500, of an average of 500. It's not reflective of that. So if it's not reflective of that, I have to reject the idea that the mean is 500 or more. I would have to conclude that it's less than 500. So we can measure that with a Z score, all right? So that's one of the things that we're going, tools that we're going to use. Now, because we know rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true is type one error, we have to draw, put a line in the sand and say, we have to put a line in the sand and say, at what point is the evidence strong enough? In other words, what value of Z that when we go beyond that point, we consider it an outlier? How can we establish that? So this is what we call Z 
critical. This is our Z critical in this case. And this area to the left of Z allows us to find that Z critical. And that's what alpha is. That's, so if we say, let's use a 5% significance level, what we are saying is I only want to take a 5% chance of being wrong if I reject the null hypothesis. So you see what happens is that we are measuring the strength of our evidence with a Z score. And as the Z score go more and more to the left, it's getting stronger and stronger. But we have to put a line that says, okay, beyond that point, it is an outlier. We'll reject the null hypothesis. It's strong enough. So that we call the rejection region. So rejection. So that's the rejection region. And since this is where we could reject the null hypothesis, that is where we can commit type 1 error. So that whole area right here is the area of possible type 1 error. So if that's the area of possible type 1 error and we want to limit our risk to 5% of type 1 error, then we have to make that area 5%. When that area is 5%, it turns out that the Z critical is negative 1.645. So that becomes our critical value, all right? That becomes the critical value right there. So in that case, what we will do is we'll calculate the Z score for the sample, and then we will say if that Z score for the sample is less than negative 1.645, the evidence is strong enough. In other words, we will reject the null hypothesis, and then we will conclude we have evidence that the mean uh, cost for heating in the winter, monthly cost, is less than $500. So in a nutshell, let me just kind of recap the, the, the concept here for you. What we're saying is state your hypotheses, gather your sample, measure the strength of the evidence with a Z score or T score, but then at some, you have to compare it to a benchmark. So as in the case of your luggage, where you will pay for excess or overweight, if you go past 50 pounds, that's what most airlines are charging nowadays. The same idea here, we say that we want a risk of 5% of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. So we will calculate a critical value based on, only, with, based on a rejection area of 5%. In this case, negative 1.645 and once we don't, once we get into that region, the rejection region, our risk of type one error is only 5%. So our critical value becomes negative 1.645 and that's the line in the sand that tells us if we go beyond that point, then that sample is not representative of the population. So we have to reject the null, we will reject the null hypothesis, but take a chance in doing so. But that chance is limited to alpha, which is our 5%. So I wanted to kind of give you a sense of that because I know that, that that concept is not easily understood in terms of how we go about rejecting. You could get very mechanical about, well, take alpha, find a critical value, then calculate the Z score, and then based on the Z score, compare it, excuse me, uh, my pen fell, compare it, and then see if um, we, you know, if we've gone beyond the critical value. That's just mechanical. But what I wanted you to think about as well is that by going beyond the Z score, by going beyond the Z score, another Z score, the critical value, what you are saying is that that sample is an outlier. And with that sample being an outlier, you, you, you would say that you now have sufficient evidence that the that, that to support your claim, all right? Because if your claim was true, if, your, if HO was true, you should not get an extreme sample like that. But because you got a sample that is extreme and further away from the mean, hmm, the reason must be because the null hypothesis is not true, okay? So the kinds of samples that will support, that will be consistent with your null hypothesis should be close to the 500. 525, 510, 
490, 495, those are close. But once I get into 450, 420, 300, you're getting further and further away, okay? Good. One last part is the p-value. A lot of people have difficulty with the p-value. So what is p-value? So let us say that here I have my critical value of negative 1.645, but that 475, let's use the data that I just I made up here, which is n is equal to 100, x bar is equal to 475, and sigma is equal to 100. Let's see what the z-score associated with that sample is. In other words, we're going to weigh it, right? So z is equal to 475 minus 500 over 100 divided by the square root of 100. That should be easy enough for us to do. That is uh, equal to negative 25. And 100 over the square root of 100 is 10, which is 2.5, negative 2.5. So look at that, negative 2.5. That means that that sample is 2.5 standard deviations away. Hmm. With 2.5 standard deviations, we are getting into extreme territory. But look at where our line in the sand is. is negative 1.645. What we're saying is that if we find any sample that is beyond negative 1.645, we're saying that that sample is strong enough evidence. I'm going to put this in blue. So here is where our sample fell, the 475, um, which gives us negative 2.5. So as you can see, the negative 2.5 is in the red territory, right? So we would reject the null hypothesis. Now to the left of that area, if I shade that in blue, that is a p-value right here p-value. So you, if you say to me, well, what, what do you mean? What, what is that? What, that's a p-value. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is if the null hypothesis is true, what is the probability that I would see that kind of sample? What is the probability that that kind of sample would, or samples like it that are even more supportive of my alternate hypothesis, what's the chance of me seeing that kind of sample? That's what we call a p-value. So right now, I have a z-score and I could compare it to the negative 1.645. That approach we call the critical value approach, where I'm comparing the negative 2.5 to a critical value of negative 1.645. That's critical value approach. But the p-value approach now compares the p-value with alpha. It compares those two. And what happens is that that p-value, whenever it is smaller than alpha, so look at our alpha. Alpha is in red, p-value is in blue. So we are in the rejection region. So notice that that area in the rejection region that is blue is our p-value happens to be smaller than the red region. It makes sense because you cannot be in the rejection region and have a p-value that is larger than alpha because we define the size of the rejection region by alpha. So to reject the null hypothesis, we must be in that region, which means our p-value must either be alpha or less. All right? In this case, it is less. So what we're saying is that the chance of observing that sample is actually quite small. Now, if I go look up two point, negative 2.5, um, negative 2.5 in my Z table, I'll give you the actual p-value. Let me um, go to my table. You're not seeing it. I'm not going to bother share it with you. You know how to use the Z table now. Negative 2.5. Negative 2.5 actually has, so that blue area is 0 0.0062, 0 0.0062. That's what the p-value turns out to be. So you can see that that is actually a lot smaller than 0 0.05. So we are saying we only are willing to take a 5% chance of committing type 1 error, but the actual probability of that kind of sample is actually 0.62%, very small. So 0.62% compared to 5%, we are essentially 
in a fairly safe territory if we reject the null hypothesis, all right? So um, that p-value measures for us the likelihood of seeing this sample if the null hypothesis is true. And it's saying, you know something? If the null hypothesis is true, there's only 62 chances in 10,000 cases that you should see that kind of sample, which is not very much. So that sample is a rare sample. It's significant, okay? So that is a rare occurrence. So that is not reflective of an average of 500. So we would reject the null hypothesis. So that's the logic. I'm trying to get you to understand the logic behind p-value or critical value approach, all right? So let me just recap the steps, the idea again. So we are looking at, um, we are looking at uh, the situation here where we want to test a hypothesis. I just know to made up a problem that says, we believe the mean cost of heating, mean monthly cost of heating in the winter for a family of four is decreasing. Historically, it's $500. We took a random sample of 10, uh, sorry, 100 individuals, families, and we found an average cost of $475. Standard deviation is known to be $100. So if I ask you what is the probability of observing this sample, you would actually calculate and find a Z value, look in the left tail for me, and then tell me that the probability of that is 0 0.0062. Well, that probability is the p-value. That's what p-value is, right? So we could do one or two approaches, use the, client, the, the critical value approach or the p-value approach. If we use the critical value approach, what we will say is that because we want to limit our, our type one error to 5%, then our line in the sand, what I call line in the sand, or our cutoff point, will be negative 1.645. How do I know that? It's because it's a, it's, I'm looking for evidence in one tail of the distribution. And when that the area of the tail is 0 0.05, the Z value is negative 1.645. So if I cross that boundary, I have enough evidence to support HA. If I don't, have, if I don't cross that boundary, so if my Z value is like say one point, negative 1.4, then I don't, it's not strong enough, all right? I have to be at least 1.645 standard deviations away from the mean to be considered significant. So that's the critical value approach. I will compare my Z value, which in this case is negative 2.5, to the negative 1.645, and I will discover that, whoa, I am way beyond the negative 1.645. I'm far. So therefore, I have strong evidence. This sample is an outlier. And by it being an outlier, it is not reflective of the null hypothesis. So that's one approach. P-value approach says, and you will get exactly the same conclusion. Eh? It's just that one is looking at uh, measuring Z scores. This one is looking at measuring probabilities. It's like sort of like measuring feet and inches or millimeters and centimeters. You just, they are related to each other. Okay, it's not two completely different concepts. So in this case, we're looking at probabilities. We say, the risk that I'm willing to take is 5%. But when I calculated the probability of observing the sample, if the null hypothesis is true, that probability is 0.62%. I'm willing to take 5% risk, but the p-value, which is my actual risk, is only 0.62%. It's much smaller, so I don't have to worry. Cool. In that case, I will reject the null hypothesis and only take a 0.62% risk. That's my p-value. So folks, if you get that concept, you're well on your way to just flying through hypothesis testing. And it's just a matter of these five steps that we got to keep going through over and over and over again. All right? So let's just very quickly um, look at some of the examples that we have uh, in here for us. I'm going to go back a little bit. I mentioned uh, critical... 
<coughs> value approach and p-value approach. So let's just um, quickly, oh, sorry. See if we, if we get these concepts. So just to kind of recap very quickly, p-value approach to one tail hypothesis testing is the probability computer using the test statistic that measures the support or lack of support for the sample in the null hypothesis, right? For, so the sample that we calculate, we assume the null hypothesis is true, calculate the probability of observing that sample, and that is considered the p-value. And you may recall that, or I may have mentioned this to you, that small probabilities are rare. Rare things are significant. Imagine I find a rare gem, a piece of diamond, you know, you know in my backyard. That's rare. You know, something is strange. Uh, and so that's significant. There was a probability of me finding diamond in my backyard, very small. So when the probability that measures the strength of the, um, of the sample is, is very small, we say it's a rare event. It's, it's significant. It's like me winning the lottery. What's, what's the probability of winning the lottery? One in 14 million. That's very small. But when, if I win it, Whoa, that's a significant event because that is a rare occurrence, right? I mean, never ever win the lottery again. In fact, I've never won the lottery. Otherwise, I wouldn't be teaching. Um, I'd be retired long, you know, in a wonderful condo built right into the, the sea. Depending on how much I won, of course. If you only win a million bucks, you can't do that. But if I won that Powerball in the U.S. for $250 million, now we're talking. So anyway, the point I'm making is that when things have rare pro small probabilities of occurrence and they happen, it's rare. Snow in July, what's the probability of that happening? Next to nothing. If it happens, it's significant. So always remember that. So the p-values should be small if the sample is supposed to be significant. Cool. We keep going. We have some, some, um, uh, some ideas that if, if the p-value happens to be less than 1%, we see that's very strong evidence. Between one and 5% is strong evidence, and five to 10% is weak evidence, and then greater than 10%, mm, insufficient evidence. So typically, we would ask you for a lot of um, cases where we'd say use a significance level of 5% and to compare your p-value to, all right? And we see here's an example uh, where in this diagram, alpha, to, alpha is 10%. So therefore, the critical value, when we calculate that, when using the 10% in the table, will be negative 1.28. But in our actual test statistic, Z value, is negative 1.46. So as you can see, it's in the rejection region. That rejection, um, the negative 1.46 is smaller than negative 1.28. So therefore, we're rejecting the hypothesis, but also to its p-value, which is to the left of it. Is smaller than the alpha. This is the, the, the value of alpha right here, which is the 10%. So we see, we see that consistency. So if we just compared the negative 1.28 to the 1.46, we call that the critical value approach. If we compare this area right here, which happens to be 0.07 to 1, to the 10%, if we compare just those two, then we are doing what we call a p-value approach, okay? And you only need to do one. You don't have to do both in any, in any test. So the book will typically ask you, do the p-value approach or do the um, critical value approach? All right. So that is, in a nutshell, the concept behind hypothesis testing. Be aware of the errors. And so here are the five steps that we, we normally take. One is we develop the hypotheses. Two. We specify the level of significance because that will help us determine our rejection region. Three, collect sample data. Four, use the test statistic. So we have to know what test statistic to use. If we are hypothesizing about a population mean, then you have to think about the sampling distribution of X bar. X bar is what estimates mu for us. So we must think about the sampling distribution of X bar. If um, sigma is known, then the sampling distribution of X bar is a normal distribution for Slimit theorem. If sigma is unknown, but N is greater than or equal to 30, we say we use the central limit theorem. And then when N is less than 30, we use the T distribution. So all of that helps us determine what distribution to use or what 
test statistic to use. So our test statistic could either be one of those three things. Z is equal to X bar minus mu sigma over root N. Or it can be X bar minus mu S over root N. And that's in the case of um, our sample size being large enough. Or we could put T, X bar minus mu S over root N, the degrees of freedom N minus one. So that's when sigma is unknown, but our sample size is less than 30. Here the case, the sample size was greater than or equal to 30. So we could use Z. So that is the steps that we would follow in conducting a hypothesis test. Now I did some examples um, in, in the videos for you uh, for hypothesis testing of the mean. For tonight's lecture, we're supposed to do hypothesis testing of proportion. So let's go to a hypothesis testing of proportion. If we have enough time, we'll come back and review a quick question with hypothesis testing of the mean. But we want to, just to be consistent with where we're supposed to be today, <coughs> excuse me, we will look at hypothesis testing of proportion. Then I'll introduce you to um, the two sample problem. And if we have a little bit of time, we'll come back to an example with hypothesis testing of the population mean. So in terms of testing of population proportions, um, just to kind of get a sense of the context for that kind of problem, I could be testing a simple hypothesis that the um, proportion of international students, for example, at St. Mary's University has increased compared to historical proportions. Now, um, I, I believe we have somewhere around 20, 25% international students. But uh, if we were comparing that historically, we might say, okay, um, we have historically, say, 25% international students. And we wanted to test whether or not that there's been an increase in the proportion of international students at St. So what would we do? We would go and take a sample maybe a thousand students, and then see how many, how many of them are international. And then we calculate a sample proportion. That sample proportion, we would then have to measure to what extent that that sample proportion is evidence, sufficient evidence that there's an increase in the proportion. So the test statistic, you've seen it before when we did confidence intervals for proportion. Here is the sample statistic is P bar, and then the standard error of the sample statistic is P1 minus P over N, and therefore Z, our test statistic, is P bar minus P over the standard error, P1 minus P over N. All right, cool. So, that here is the Z value that we would use as our test statistic for hypothesis tests involving proportions. Now, remember, we still require the same assumptions for us to be able to use, um, for us to be able to use this distribution. We have to assume, <clears throat> or we have to test, that n times p is greater than or equal to five, and one times, so n times one minus p is also greater than or equal to five. This condition must be satisfied. That allows us to do what we call a normal approximation to the binomial distribution. That's what it allows us to do. Normal approximation to binomial, and then we could go ahead and do our 
example. The hypotheses, uh, let me just, uh, if we go back here, remember that there are three forms that it could take, which is we want to prove that the true proportion is less than a value, particular value, or that proportion is greater than a value. And in that, that case, your area would be in one of the tails, your rejection region, or where you're looking for evidence would be in one tail. But then if we say it's not equal to a particular value, we'll be looking for evidence in both tails of the region. That's important for us to know because it will determine what we find as our critical values, all right? Let's just see what I mean by that. If I'm testing the hypothesis, if my research hypothesis is that P is less than P0, some value, then the sample proportions that helps me out will be proportions that are smaller than this value. Let's just say this value for the sake of argument is 50%. So I'm trying to find evidence that the true proportion is less than 50%. I will be looking for values here. In other words, 0 0.45, 0 0.32, all of those values are smaller than 50%. So it will be on the left. And at some point I will say, here's my critical value and that area must be alpha. So that would be my rejection region right here, reject HO. So my rejection region is set up so that my critical value is such that the size of the rejection region is alpha. And that alpha isn't just one tail, in this case, the left tail. If I'm doing this one, HAP is greater than P0, then the opposite is true, all right? Well, what values, if, if, I'm, if I use the 0.5 again, what values would be evident? What values in my sample, sample proportions would be evidence? Well, the sample proportions that would be evidence would be like a 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.65, 0 0.59, Anything greater than 0.5 would be evidence. But of course we have to say, yeah, but when is that evidence enough? Well, that evidence will be enough when we set this to alpha and then we calculate the Z critical and then we could compare the Z value that we get for our sample to Z critical or we could compare the P value, the probability associated with that sample to alpha. Now in the next case, the third case, when we say HA, sorry, P is not equal to P0. So for example, we might just say, if um, the historical proportion is 50%, that we believe it has changed, is now different from 50%, which means it's possible for it to be larger than 50% and smaller than 50%. So in that case, this would be evidence to support us, and this would be evidence to support us, all right? So we have a two-tail case. Because we want to limit our risk of type 1 error to alpha, 5%, say for example, then the total size of the two rejection, these are two rejection regions that will work for this problem, but the total size must be equal to alpha. So what do we do? We divide each one by two because it's symmetrical. So that would be alpha over two, alpha over two. Our critical value over here would be negative Z alpha over two. Our critical value over here would be Z alpha over two. So if alpha was say 10%, then this would be 0 0.05, in which case the Z value is 1.645. And it's a negative 1.645. So those would be our critical um, values right there that we would compare our Z value to. So I want you to just um, keep that in mind, all right? Let's see if we find an example to work through that will help us. So here's an example. Has a two-tailed test about a population proportion. For Christmas and New Year's week, the National Safety Council estimated that 500 people would be killed <laughs> and 25,000 injured on the nation's roads. Wow, that's heavy. The NSE claimed that 50% of the accidents would be caused by drunk driving. 
A sample of 120 accidents showed that 67 of them were caused by drunk driving. Use the data to test the claim with an alpha of 5%, or 0.05. So what are they claiming? They're claiming 50% of those accidents will be caused by drunk driving. So you have, out of 120, 67 were caused by drunk driving. Now, if the claim was true, of the 120 accidents, how many of them should be drunk driving? 60, that's 50% 50 of 120. But notice the 67 is a little higher. So it seemed to suggest that the true proportion of accidents caused by drunk driving is different from the 50%, all right? It's different. Notice they didn't ask us to test whether or not a higher proportion of accidents, right, were caused by drunk driving. It just simply said, test the claim that is 50%. So what we'll have to do is assume that it is 50%, but then see if the evidence can support that it is not 50%, that is different from 50%. So our hypothesis would be that the true proportion is 50%, Versus it is not 50%. That's step one. What's our significance level? Our significance level is alpha. Now, is this a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test? It is a two-tailed test. Whenever we see not equal to, it means that your evidence could be greater than that value or less than that value. So sample proportions bigger than 50% or sample proportions smaller than 50% are both evidence that the proportion is not 50%. So that's a two-tailed test, okay? Now we could compute the value of our test statistic. The value of our test statistic in this case, because we're dealing with a sample proportion, excuse me, our sampling distribution is a normal distribution. And with it being a normal distribution, excuse me, then we calculate Z. Z is P bar minus P over the standard error, which you see here, but remember that standard error is P1 minus P over N. So once we do the substitution for that, you see here is our standard error right here. We could calculate our Z value, which turns out to be 1.28, 1.28. So now we're going to either do a, a p-value approach or we're going to do a critical value approach. So I'm going to actually just create my own little uh, sheet there for a moment in between here because I like to work with diagrams. So in this case, we have 0.5. That's what we're testing. And now we are going to look in, it's a two-tailed test. So this would be alpha over two, alpha over two. Since alpha is um, 0 0.05, 5%, then this is 0 0.025, 0 0.025, which makes this, let me see, 1.96. I just happen to know it off the top of my head, but you could go and find it by looking at the Z table. Just look up, just look up negative 1.25, right? Sorry, let's look up um, 0 0.025, area in the tail, and then you'll get negative 1.96. So in that case now, if our Z value is greater than or equal to 1.96, or if the Z value is less than or equal to negative 1.96, we will reject the null hypothesis. So that's our decision rule. That's a decision rule that we would use to compare that. Or if the p-value, or if p-value is less than alpha, reject HO. Okay. 
So <clears throat> what is our sample value that we got? 67. So P bar is 67 over 120 is equal to, let me grab my calculator. 67 divided by 120 equal 0.558. So as you can see, 0.558 would be somewhere here, larger than 0 0.50. 0.50. The question is, is it in the rejection region? I, you know, I have not calculated that yet. So we know that the critical value is 1.96 plus or minus 1.96 we would have to find out if it's in the critical region. Let's find it out. If we look here, oh, actually, I think um, the calculation was already done for us. That it turned out to, it turned out to be 1.28. So our Z value for this problem So the 1.28 is, that's in terms of Z, that's the actual problem, but P, P like right here, but this Z value, this 1.28 is smaller than 1.96. So we are not quite in the rejection region at all. We're not quite in the rejection region. All right? So, which means that we will not reject the null hypothesis. Now, what is the p-value? If we're doing, before, before I get into p-value, if we were doing the critical value approach, we would just compare the 1.28 to the 1.96 and we're, we're pretty much done. But with the p-value, we must now calculate this area right here. And I'm going to shade it in green to represent the probability associated with the sample. But when I calculate that, that will only be half the p-value, why? Because if I had negative 1.28 over here, let's put it in a different color. Let's put it in green as well. Then that also is the other half of the p-value. So it turns out that that would be half of the p-value, p-value over two, and this would be half of the p-value, p-value over two. So we must calculate the green area multiplied by two. What's that green area? If I look up 1.20, that 1.20, sorry, 1.28, sorry, no, 1.20, 1.28. If I look that up in the Z table, if I'm not mistaken, it should be, let me see, um, let me just see what it turns out to be. Mm -hmm. All right, so I was going to say, yeah, it should be, that should be 10% in the tail. When you multiply by two, it should be about 20%. So this green area is approximately 0 0.1003, 0 0.1003. So when we add up those two to give us a p-value, p-value, is equal to two multiplied by 0 0.1003 or to 0 0.2006. In other words, 20.06%. That's your p-value. So if we want to reject the null hypothesis, we would have to be willing to take a 20% risk of being wrong. That's a huge risk. But we only told that we allowed 5% risk of being wrong. So that's why we will not reject the null hypothesis for this question, all right? We will not reject the null hypothesis. So as you can see here, with this p-value, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. So that's how we get, we get, um, we do this problem. So just to recap with this particular problem. So we have a case where we do a two-tailed test we want to determine the hypotheses. We're saying that um, true proportion is 50% versus not 50%. The significance level is alpha, which is 5%. Because the two-tailed test, we'll have to divide that alpha between the two tails. 
and then we calculate the value of the test statistic, which is um, Z. The reason why we can use Z is because if we were to take the 0.5 and multiply it by 120, we'll get 60, which is greater than five. And then one minus 0 0.5 times 120 is also 60, which means that it is greater than five. We can use the normal distribution, the Z value. So we calculated it to be 1.28. If we're doing the critical value approach, we'll just compare that 1.28 to the um, critical value. But with a 5% significance level, the critical value is 1.96 or negative 1.96. And as you can see, 1.28 is smaller than 1.96, so we'll feel to reject the null hypothesis. But with the p-value approach, we must take that 1.28 and calculate the probability associated with it. So when we have a z-value of 1.28, the area in the tail is 0 0.1003. You could actually find that in your table. But because it's a two-tailed test, that p-value that value that we calculated with the point 1003 is only half of the p-value must multiply by two, all right? And then that gives us the point 2006, which tells us that the p-value is 20%. If we want to reject the null hypothesis, the risk we will take is 20%. Always remember that. The actual risk you take of committing type one error is the p-value but we want to compare that p-value to alpha so that we don't take any more risk than you are allowed to take. It's like this. It's like you go into a store and you, you have a budget of say $50. You don't purchase anything greater than $50 because it is inconsistent with your budget. You don't do that. So if it is less than your budget, you buy it. If it's greater than your budget, you don't buy it. So it's the same idea our p-value must be less than the 5%. But because it's 20%, it is more than the risk we are willing to take, so therefore we will not reject the null hypothesis. So I hope you get the concept. I like to teach by concepts, not just telling you to add this, subtract this, or multiply that. So I hope you're following me, because if you understand the principles, I think you will be able to work, work the problems a lot easier. You'll get less confused. So hopefully I'm not confusing you with all these explanations, all right? Good, so that's the question to do with proportion. I believe I had a question here at the end of this. Let me see. I have a question here that um, I think I, what I'll do is I could go through it with you just to kind of um, dum, 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 dum. I see a similar study, that's changed in the past year. Okay, so let's just take a look at this question right here and just analyze it and see um, what we can do. This question is not from your textbook. It's from uh, a sample assignment from before. Let's just read it and see if we could appreciate what's involved with it, all right? So let's just take a look and see if we could set it up. And then I will let you solve it, but I'll, I'll help you set it up. So Nova Corporation wanted to know what its market share is in the Nova Scotia market for cheddar cheese. Last month, a random sample of 380 consumers, all of whom had purchased some type of cheddar cheese was drawn from across Nova Scotia. 76 of those individuals had purchased Nova Cheddar, right? So remember we said, what it said, 380 consumers, 76 of them. Using alpha is 5% and a p-value approach, is there evidence to suggest that sales staff have exceeded the company's objective of securing 12% of the market? So you see, they want 12% of the market. And when we look at the data, it says 76. It says here, 76 of 380 people 
uh, had purchased the cheddar cheese. So let's just do part A, because part B now is a two sample problem and we're not doing two sample problems yet. So using alpha is 0 0.05 is the evidence that it has exceeded the objective. Well, what's the objective? They wanted 12%. So if they've exceeded the objective, that means P must be greater than 12%. So let's look at this. Uh, so this particular problem, our sample size is 380. The number of people who purchased Nova Cheddar was 76. And so therefore our sample proportion is 76 over 380. Now a question you might, <coughs> excuse me, you might ask me is how did I know it was proportion? I knew it was proportion because proportion problems involve counting of data. So 76 of 380, that's a proportion. Whereas means or our averages is a measurement. You're measuring volume, you're measuring distance, you're measuring time, you're measuring salaries. But um, in this case right here, we're just counting. How many people purchase the cheddar? 76. Out of how many? 380. That's a proportion of people. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, that's 20%. All right? So what was the sales target? The sales target was 12%. So if we wanted to find out if they exceeded the target, our HO, HA would be that they exceeded the target, which means that it's greater than 20%, not 20%, sorry, 12%, because remember that um, 0.12, if they did not exceed the target, it's less than or equal to 0.12. So this is target not exceeded, target exceeded. That's step one. Step two, what is our alpha? Uh, we were told 5%. What is our value of our test statistic in this case? Three. So the value of the test statistic, because we know that uh, if we were to take 12, um, P, 12% 12 of 380, we would definitely have a value that's greater than five. So we could calculate Z. Z is equal to our sample value, which is 0.20 minus 0 0.12, 0 0.12, 1 minus 0 0.12, which is 0 0.88 over 380. That would give us the Z value. Now, if we're using the p-value approach, we must take, this is a one-tailed test, not a two-tailed test. We must take the Z value associated with this and then compute the p the p value so step four p value would be the prop let's call it z zero the probability of z greater than or equal to z zero and why i say greater than is because this is point one two this is point two zero so we are somewhere up here so the p value is this area right here p value which basically is the probability of P bar being greater than or equal to 20% or whatever we calculated as Z value to be, the probability of Z being greater than or equal to that. That would be our P value. Now, I don't have the actual calculation here, but certainly you could actually find that Z value and then go ahead and complete that question. Uh, let me see if I could uh, do this fast enough. Square root, open bracket, open bracket. Um, let's see here, two, 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 two. point one two times point eight eight divided by three eight t close bracket. Uh huh and invert that function, multiply by 0 0.08.
So it turns out that that is point four point point four eight. So that z value is four not point four eight four point eight zero. Woo! This is huge. So this four point eight zero. This is definitely greater than if if we look at the critical value of five percent, it would be one point six four five. So z critical is a lot smaller than 4.80, but since we're dealing with p-value, pz greater than or equal to 4.8 is less than 0 0.001, which is what, which is basically what our, our textbook gives us. At 3.09, the area in the tail is 0 0.001. At 4.8, is less than 4.001. So this is less than alpha. So five cents p-value is less than 0 0.05, we will reject HO. And if we reject the null hypothesis, what do we conclude? The sales target conclude, sales target achieved. Can we commit an error? Yes, possibility of type one error. And what's that probability of type one error? Is point less than point zero zero one. Sorry, less than point zero zero one. That's the possibility or uh, probability of type one error. So that here is how we would do uh, uh, this particular question, and that sort of brings us to the end of chapter nine. This that I covered today, a quick review. An example with proportions, plus what you had in the video with um, with um, hypothesis testing of the mean, where sigma is known as sigma is unknown. All right. Now for the last part, any questions at this point? Let me see if there are any questions in the chat section. Uh, let's see here, chat. Okay, I don't have any questions in the chat in the chat room. So there are no questions at this point. I will introduce you to two sample problems, all right? And we could try to do one example and then that should. And then if you have any questions about the, I think the test we have over the weekend, um, essentially you, um, the, the period, you, 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 you're able to access the test. You only have one take, you're able to access the test from Friday, you have until Sunday to finish it. Um, this is not a case where you could save and come back. Once you start the test, the clock is running and you must sit and finish it. Um, once the time is up, I believe it's, um, you probably have two hours to do it. Once the time is up, it's, it's, it's up. So please, uh, unlike an assignment that has no time limit, where you could save and continue and save and continue until you submit, this one, the clock is running. And once the time has passed, it will auto submit your test. Okay. All right. So yes, go ahead. Um, is our test and our assignment due the same day? I do not think so. Um, num assignment number three should not be due the same day. Okay. So <laughs> the test it's due this Sunday. Excuse me, the assignment is due Sunday? It shows that on line tap, yeah, assignment three. Okay, let me just um, double check the course outline. Give me one minute. Okay. Assignment number three. Sorry, I'm suffering with a little cool here. Okay, it says, for, okay, all right. So I'm gonna change that. Okay, right. perfect. So um, we'll make assignment three due the following weekend. Okay, great. And I have another question too when we're on the same topic. Um, sure. Is it just expected <clears throat> that like this test is an open book, like we should be doing this without any kind of study aids, correct? Um, no, well, and, well no, that, I, I cannot monitor that. So that's yeah. fine. You could you use your notes and so forth. Okay, perfect. Thank you. It's, it's an open book exam. Yes. The one that will be closed book is the final, the final test. Okay, perfect, thanks. Which we will still do online, but we will do it face-to-face -face and it will be a closed book test. Okay, um, exam, the very, the very final exam. Yes. Okay, so, I, so I'm just making a note to myself that we should, I should change this to 
the following weekend, assignment number three, assignment four, which makes sense because assignment four is not due until March 11. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, almost two weeks later. That's great. All right, so uh, I will send out a notice to that effect and then um, change the due date to uh, the following week. So you don't have to worry about trying to do both of those things this weekend, no. Okay, let's just take a quick um, introduction to two population problems now. And I just have to change my, let me see if I'm close. Bear with me while I pull up my next file. Okay, so here we go. All right, so, so far we've talked about single population problems, right? Where we're trying to find for single population, we're testing the population parameter, whether the mean is greater than a particular value, less than a particular value, etc. cetera. Um, Proportion, same thing, greater than value, less than, not equal to. But now we come to the case where we are interested in two or more populations. So for example, I talked a bit about the estimating the mean cost of heating during the winter for family of four. Let's say this were Halifax data that I was, I was looking at. What if we wanted to compare that to another city, like Ontario, like Toronto, sorry. <clears throat> so we could be now interested in the difference between the average uh, heating cost for a family of four in the winter in Toronto compared to Nova Scotia. Why might that be important? Who knows? Yeah, if you're looking for a city to settle in and you wanted to find out which city is cheaper, so it could be the average grocery bill, for example, monthly grocery bill. Is it cheaper in Ontario, uh, in Ontario versus Nova Scotia? You know, you, you could ask this question. So this question can actually be framed as a hypothesis. But now we have to take samples from each population. We have to take samples from each population and then compare the sample statistics. So let's see what that, that, that looks like. So here's a case where we are trying to now draw inferences and do interval estimations about population means with two populations and proportions of two populations. So we look at the case where sigma one and sigma two are known, sigma one, sigma two are unknown. And then we will also look at this concept called matched samples. So that's gonna be in our next lecture. Right now, I'm just gonna give you a quick introduction to this case right here, which is Difference between two population means when sigma one and sigma two are known. So we could actually do, just like we did with the case of mu, we had an interval estimation and a hypothesis test. We could do the same thing. So this could be uh, our difference between Ontario and Nova Scotia, between um, Alberta and Newfoundland, whatever it is as an example. And so in much the same way for a single population where we had a confidence interval X bar plus or minus Z or T sigma over root N. And then we did a hypothesis testing zero H A mu, mu either greater than, less than or equal to mu zero. And then we had the different cases greater than mu zero mu less than mu zero, mu not equal to mu zero. So we had those three cases. The same way we could do that here, we could do the same thing. We, mu one minus mu two, we could actually get an interval estimate for the difference between two population means. 
and it will look something like this, x bar one minus x bar two. So what you notice, here we have our, our sample statistic. Here's our sample estimate, which will estimate mu one minus mu two for us. And then it has a critical value, z, but then the standard error look, formula looks a little different. It's sigma one squared over n one plus sigma two squared over n two. So that's the confidence interval or interval estimation for mu one minus mu two. And we could show you the mathematical proof for where that comes from, but I don't think we're interested in getting into that. We don't have to know that. The important thing to note is that this interval estimation have the same three components. One, which we call the sample uh, st um, statistic or point estimate. Remember that point estimate? Critical value, standard error. All of the confidence intervals have exactly that same form. All right? And so we could, um, so we could, we could do this. We could say a one minus alpha times 100% confidence interval for mu one minus mu two is given by, sorry, x bar one minus x bar two plus or minus z sigma one squared over n one sigma two squared over n two. And that's when sigma one and sigma two are known. When they are unknown, it gets very unwieldy. So we'll deal with that in our next class when we're a little less tired, all right? Um, so those unknown, and that's kind of what that looks like. In terms of the hypothesis test now, we have the following. So we'll have HO, HA. So we either have this case here, mu one minus mu two. So we're testing for the difference between them um, is less than or equal to zero, which means mu one minus mu two is greater than zero as our alternate. Or we can say mu one minus mu two is greater than or equal to zero because mu one minus mu two is less than zero. Or mu one minus mu two is equal to zero, mu one minus mu two is not equal to zero. So these are the three situations. So essentially in the first case, what we are saying is that um, we want to try to prove that mu one, the mean, for example, let's just think of the, the Ontario and Nova Scotia. Let's say one is um, Ontario, two is Nova Scotia. One Ontario, two is Nova Scotia. So in this case, what are we testing? We're testing that the mean for Ontario is greater than the mean for Nova Scotia, if we're looking at either heating oil or expenditure on groceries, right? That's what we are trying to test in HA. In this case right here, because mu one minus mu two is less than zero, that means mu two is greater, which means that for the second case, we're testing that the mean for Nova Scotia is greater than the mean for Ontario. And in the third case, we're just simply testing that they are different. We don't know which one or we don't necessarily care at this point, which is larger. We're just testing that they're not the same. So that is kind of similar to what you saw with the single case, single uh, parameter case. But this time we're talking about two population parameters and we are interested in the difference between them, right? Do St. Mary students spend more on textbooks than Dow students? So we look at the average cost in textbooks, textbooks for a SMU business student versus the average cost of textbooks for a, a Dow business student. And we're trying to assess who spends more money on textbooks, who spends more money on entertainment, who travels longer distances or commutes to school in the morning. 
down business student versus a smear business student. So that's two populations right there. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right. So let us see if we could find. Once we, since we already have a very good sense of the steps involved in a hypothesis test from the single population question, all we have to do is to apply it here. So let's see if we can find um, an example that we could go through. But as you could see here, here is um, the difference, the population difference, and here's the standard error. Oops, sorry. Here's the confidence interval I showed you earlier. And then the test statistic you'll see in a little while. <clears throat> So here's an example for us right here. Question five, that actually is taken out of your textbook. Question five, chapter, one, um, chapter 10. Uh, the USA Today reports that the average expenditure on Valentine's Day and Valentine's Day is tomorrow. So happy Valentine's Day to you guys. Um, do male and female consumers differ in the amounts they spend? Hmm, good question. Do the women spend more? Do the men spend more? So the average expenditure in a sample survey of 40 male consumers was $135.67. The average expenditure in a sample survey of 30 females was $68.64. Ooh, <laughs> look at that. Sample evidence. Men have to spend more money on the women than the women. <laughs> men, <laughs> 68, 64. That's interesting. So based on past surveys, the standard deviation for male consumers is assumed to be $35. Standard deviation for females is considered to be 20. What is the point estimate of the difference between the population mean expenditure for males and the population mean expenditure for females? So we now want the sample difference. So clearly you see a difference already just in terms of the sample estimates. $68 versus 135 almost two to one uh, in this case like that. And then now we want a confidence interval for that. So we'll find out a 99% confidence interval was the margin of error. Because remember now, a confidence interval has a point estimate, a critical value, a standard error, but a standard error times a critical value gives us the margin of error. And then develop the 99% confidence interval. So if we look at this question right here, we'll see that to get our point estimate, we simply subtract 135.67 minus 68.64. And as you can see, it's almost double. So $67.03 is the difference. That's our point estimate. Second part we need is the margin of error. The margin of error is the critical value, this part right here, times the standard error. So we are looking for a 90, <clears throat> I think it's a 99% confidence interval. Let's go back. 99% confidence interval. It turns out that the Z value for 99% confidence interval is 2.576. Some people use 2.58. Just in case you're not sure how we, we got that, here's what you would do. Remember, it's a 99% confidence interval. So if it's 99%, that area, in the shaded area is 0.99, which means what's on the outside is 0 0.01. But because it's split between the two tails, because we have to split that between the two tails, that would be 0 0.005, 0 0.005. So when we add them, it comes up to 0 0.01. If you look up this area, 0 0.005 in the table, you'll get negative 2.576 plus 2.576. Actually, you, you get 2.58 because you don't get three decimal places from the table. This is ready from Excel. And so that's, if you take that information, here's our critical value for Z. Here's the 35 standard deviation for, I believe it was for men. 
$20 for women and the different sample sizes, it gives us a margin of error of 17.8. When we take $67 plus or minus $17.08, we get that the interval, in other words, 49.95, the mean for men minus the mean for women. That's essentially what we got, 84.11. So what does that tell us? That tells us that somehow men spend somewhere between, um, somewhere between 49.95 and 84.11 dollars more on average than women do for Valentine's Day. Why is that? You can come up with all kinds of explanations, maybe because Valentine's Day is more about the women, so the men have to show um, the partners, right, that, um, that they're valuable, and so we have to spend some more money to, to show that to our partners. So here we go. This is what this interval is saying, all right? That men, um, men spend on average more money than women uh, in, in, uh, in terms of the amount spent, mean amount spent for Valentine's Day, somewhere between $49.95 and $84.11 more. Remember, that's a a confidence interval for the difference, not the exact value, but the difference. So that's the difference between the two. Because both of those differences are positive, then that confidence interval tells us for sure that um, statistically speaking, of course, men spend more money on average than women do. If one sign was negative and the other one was positive, then we would not be sure. If the interval contains zero, excuse me, it means that there is a possibility that they spend the same average amount. But because the interval does not contain a zero, any value in that interval, mu m is greater than mu w. So therefore, we will conclude, based on the sample data, that men on average spend more money than women and they spend between $50 and $84 more. Somewhere between $50 and $84 more. We don't know exactly how much. Somewhere in that range, okay? So that is a confidence interval um, problem here with that. In terms of a hypothesis testing question, um, as I've already mentioned to you, that these are the hypotheses that we would have. Now, I had greater than zero, I had, I used zero where, where the D zero was, but D zero just simply means a value, a difference. That difference could be zero, it could be a positive value. So that's more generic. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the test statistic is, as you, you will recall, for a single sample problem, we said Z is X bar minus mu sigma over root N. Well, if you look at that formula, you see the, the equivalent between them. That's your point estimate. That's your point estimate. That's your population difference, population value. That's your population difference. And that's the standard error, and that's the standard error. So it's the same concept. And so in doing a hypothesis test, we will do exactly the same five steps, except that now, our hypotheses will have to refer to two populations, and our test statistic would be a little different. That's all. But the same steps uh, would apply, okay? I think I have a sample problem there somewhere. Let's see. Okay. So here's one problem. This is question seven from chapter 10 in your textbook. Consumer Reports uses a survey of readers 
to obtain customer satisfaction ratings for the nation's largest retailers. That's going to be our last problem. Each survey respondent is asked to rate a specified retailer in terms of six factors, the quality of their products, selection, value, checkout efficiency, service, and store layout. An overall satisfaction score summarizes the rating of each respondent with 100 meaning the respondents come out easily satisfied in all six factors. The sample data uh, representative of independent samples of Target and Walmart customers are shown below. So you can see here they have the two populations, one representing Target and one representing Walmart. 25 people were selected for Target, 30 people were selected for Walmart. They could have been the same, but it doesn't have to be the same. Now, you might say, oh, N1 is smaller than 30. So are we running into the T distribution yet? Let's see if we have the population standard deviations. If we have the population standard deviation, we don't need um, to use the T distribution. Formulate the null and alternate hypothesis to test whether there is a difference between the mean population so between the population mean customer satisfaction scores for the two retailers. So in other words, the mean population scores, mu1 and mu2, or mu target and mu Walmart, is there a difference between them? So we got to do the hypothesis for that. Assume the experience with the consumer report satisfaction rating scale indicates that a population standard deviation of 12 is reasonable assumption for both of them. So both of them will have a sigma of 12. Conduct the hypothesis test and report the p-value. At a 5% level of significance, what is your conclusion? All right? So let's go through this. And then there's a part C, which retailer, if uh, either, appears to have the greater customer satisfaction, provide a 95% confidence interval. So we could actually take the same data and do a confidence interval for that very same data. So I have the solution here written out, so I'm just going to go over it with you. So... Mu1 will be the population for Target, mean for Target, Mu2 population mean for Walmart. So because we want to test if there's a difference between them, our null hypothesis, which is our assumption, would be that there's no difference between them. So that's HO. No difference between them and that there is a difference. We're not saying that one is bigger than the other. We're just saying that there's a difference. So right now, our sample difference is 79 minus 80. 71 is 8. Sample evidence seems to suggest there's a difference, but is that difference big enough that it is significant? So what we do is we take our Z-score to measure the weight of that evidence. Remember, that's what a Z-score does for you. It gives you the weight of the evidence, all right? So in that case, the weight of that evidence, 79 minus 71, and then the difference, do you see, notice here, is D0 is 0. So that's why we have 0 over here. And then we take uh, 12 as our standard deviation, 25 and 30 as our sample sizes, and we get a value of 2.46. Now, based on your knowledge of Z values, 2.46 is a reasonable is a reasonably large um, Z score. However, remember it all depends on how much risk we are willing to take. So we have to calculate the p-value for this area right here. So at 2.46, we will find that um, if you use if you use the cumulative table, right? You could subtract it from point 0.1, from one, from, sorry, from 1, and then multiply that by 2. Because it's a two-tailed test, remember that this is a two-tailed test from HA. So when we calculate the 2.46, if you look up 2.46, the book will give you the table will give you all of this area. That area is 0.9931. So if we subtract from 0.1, we will get the area of the tail, which is 0.0069. But that tail right here 
it's only have the p-value. Why? Because it's a two-tailed test. The other half of that p-value is down here at negative 2.46. So we must take this and multiply it by 2. So 2 multiplied by 0 0.0069 is our p-value, which is 0 0.0138. So how much risk were we willing to take? I think we said that we're willing to take a 5% risk. So since we're only going to take a 1.38% risk, our p-value is smaller than 5%. We will reject the null hypothesis. There is a difference between the mean satisfaction for the two stores or the two retailers. And based on the sample evidence that we have, people are more satisfied with Target than they're satisfied with Walmart which is quite interesting. Walmart, we hear so much about. But according to this data, assuming that that's real data, and I suspect it might very well be real data, we see generally people are more satisfied with Target than they are with Walmart. So that's the hypothesis test. Same steps that we talked about earlier. And then if you want to find a confidence interval, 95% confidence interval, because we are using the same level of significance, which is 5%, 95% confidence interval has a 5% significance level, we should come to the same conclusion. So we use the sample difference, x bar one minus x bar two. Remember, that's our point estimate. So that's the eight right here. The critical value, 1.96, that's based on 95% confidence. And then the standard error. When we do this, we find that the difference is between 1.63 to 14.37. In other words, mu target minus mu Walmart is between 1.63, 14.37. And notice that there's no zero in that interval, which means any value in that interval is positive. And since any value in the interval is positive, it means that target, new target, sorry, is greater than new Walmart. That's the only way you get a positive difference is if this value is bigger than that value, which means that target's satisfaction score is higher than Walmart satisfaction score, all right? And so that is finding a confidence interval and a hypothesis test with two population parameters with a difference between two population means, but sigma is known. When sigma is not known, we have to now go to the T distribution and we're going to need to calculate the degrees of freedom and the degrees of freedom formula is a crazy looking formula. It looks like this, look at that. But you know, you could do it in Excel, uh, in, 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 in a test, maybe we might give you that value, I'm not sure, but at home certainly you could put this in a spreadsheet. That's the degrees of freedom formula. Can you believe that? It's really crazy. Whereas before that we just said DF is N minus one, but look at the calculation for degrees of freedom. It's a lot more involved here. So we'll stop, to, I'll stop on that because this section right here is actually our next lecture, which is on the 20th. Next week is um, spring break. So one reason why I want to give you a test before spring break so you could enjoy it, relax and enjoy your, your spring break and not have to be studying uh, for our next week. You may have to study some other course, but it's certainly not uh, our course, right? So. That's great. Um, any questions for me before we close down? It's now 8.57, so we're right on time with three minutes to go. Yeah, so what, what sections are on the test? Um, it is um, the sections covered by assignments one and two. Okay. Right. Good, good. Hi. Um, on the, I think it was the um, overview, like on MindTap, where it shows the assignment, or the test, sorry, it says covers assignment one and two up to chapter nine. So, but chapter so nine. Chapter, was, 10, chapter 10 will not be included. No, that's right. Will chapter nine be included? 
chapter nine will be included um, because um, last week's lecture covered um, a chunk of chapter nine and there was just this little piece that was left which had to do with uh, proportion today. Okay, and would you recommend um, just studying our old assignment, like our last two assignments to prepare for the test? I think if you, if you understand the concepts in that very well, then you should be fine. Um, what I also suggest that you do is that um, some of the sample problems in, because this is a, a mind tap test, so some of the practice questions in mind tap as well could be helpful. Or okay. um, um, go to the sort of end of the, the, the sections in the, various, in the various chapters, and you will notice that there are two types of uh, exercises. One set that says methods, and the other one applications. I would try, you know, one or two questions on the application side because they just have a little, you just have to, they have a little more reading and comprehension than the methods questions. The method questions tend to be more mechanical just to make sure you get the process of computation correct. Now the other, um, the, the one that deals with applications focus a little more on understand, reading the question, picking out the right information and then doing the computation. So if you could do the um, application ones, and then, um, and then the, 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 the test will be similar in style to a time to the level of complexity, right? The, the similarity in terms of the level of complexity. Um, and so that should be a good guide for you in terms of this, the kind of questions you might want to practice. All right? Thank you. No problem. Okay, folks, any other questions? How, um... I am, I'm looking at the, the, the performance so far is not bad. I noticed the average for assignment two went down a little bit. But what's interesting, like I said, uh, I think maybe people are just using the recording. That's, this recording will be up once it's processed. I'll post the link as well. But I'm um, typically seeing, we have 28 students registered, but only about um, eight, nine, or 10 people are showing up online. So I'm not sure um, if they just are, are doing it on their own. They don't have to show up online because the video lectures are there. The MindTap provides videos as well, which is one of the reasons why I chose it in addition to what I do, that is additional um, you know, support in that regard within MindTap itself. So, but so far, the two assignments, and I mean, the average is one was 80-something, one was 70-something. I hope that we could keep it above the 75 range and um, then I'd be happy with that. All right. Okay, then you guys take care. Have a good night. And then um, I will see you a week from, no, two weeks from today online. But I will be monitoring your progress over the weekend with the, with the exam. In case there are any issues. Okay. All right, then. Take care. Have a good night. Thanks. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.